Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good afternoon, and welcome to The Armor of Faith, a show where we hope to bring our listeners closer to the Word of God and the blessings we receive through living in the fullness of the Catholic faith. My name is Doug, and I'll be your host as we discuss the blessings of the Church Christ built upon Peter. And I'm joined today by my lovely wife, uh, as well as uh, friends of ours, Dan and Helen Hawkins. And our panelists provide support to catechesis for religious formation at St. Philip Benizi Catholic Mission in Cedar Ranch, Colorado. We're also in the process of discernment and study to become lay Dominicans, who are also known as the Order of Preachers. So welcome to our panelists, as well as to our listeners. Let us open with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts in thanks and praise for this opportunity to open and share your holy word this day. We pray that you are with us and all our listeners as we share with one another the blessings of faith. We pray you will grant us wisdom and understanding as we seek to learn your holy truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. So last week we discussed what we reflect upon and celebrate during the course of the Mass. This week we'll begin talking about the order of the Mass and the scripture which guides us in our reflection and celebration. We also recently spoke about the role of parents to teach their children. We hope that during the course of our discussion, we'll also offer some insight that may help parents, grandparents, and maybe even grandparents, uh, to help the children within their families to become aware of and experience the many blessings of the Mass. As we prepared for the show this week, some interesting insights fell into our laps as a result of a course in which we were engaged that is presented through Ascension Press. Give them a free plug here. It is a a course on the book of Revelation presented by Jeff Cavins, who is a self-described revert to the Catholic faith. He was raised Catholic, but for a period of time, he left the faith and became a Protestant pastor. He has since returned to the Catholic faith and has produced some wonderful Bible study courses. And the segment we received this week had some very interesting comments about the Mass. Jeff steered us to Article 1090 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which reads, in the earthly liturgy, we share in a foretaste of that heavenly liturgy which is celebrated by the holy city of Jerusalem, toward which we journey as pilgrims, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. With all the warriors of the heavenly army, we sing a hymn of glory to the Lord, venerating the memory of the saints. We hope for some part and fellowship with them. We eagerly await the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, until he, our life, shall appear, and we too will appear with him in glory. While my appreciation of the Mass continues to grow, the more I discover about it, this article of the Catechism of the Catholic Church provides an insight I had never really truly contemplated before. I want you to listen to these words again. In the earthly liturgy, we share in a foretaste of that heavenly liturgy. I'd like you to consider that we reflect upon our existence from the perspective of what we experience here on earth. But can we imagine the liturgy of heaven? Can we imagine what it must be like with choirs of angels and the prayers of saints? And by the way, these prayers lifted up by the saints include prayers which we ask the saints to pray with us. It is in the heavenly liturgy that the prayers of worship and intercessions are lifted up for us by the holy ones. Consider Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, which says, When he, which is referring to the lamb who seemed to have been slain, took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each of the elders held held a harp and gold bowls filled with incense which are the prayers of the Holy Ones. Now, in the Dewey Rhymes version, instead of the words Holy Ones, the word saints is there. And, of course, that is the meaning of saints, is becoming uh, or or those who have found holiness on, on earth. So that verse tells us that the saints collect our prayers and they lift them up 
uh, and uh, look them up for us. And I assume that this is also what they do during the course of the heavenly liturgy. Anyway, I, I digress here because what I was really talking about was how Jeff was viewing the Mass. And during Jeff's presentation, he related a story about an audience he and his family had with Pope John Paul II. And I guess I should say Pope St. John Paul II. He commented that they were diligent about their dress, grooming, and how they presented themselves because, after all, they were having an audience with a pope, and they wanted to present the absolute best of themselves. Then Jeff, Jeff asked, if we do this for the pope, what do we do when we have an audience with the king? That simple question put into perspective how we should view both the mass and adoration. In both circumstances, we're in the presence of the king of kings and lord of lords. Should we not seek to present the best of ourselves to the king and endeavor to obtain the most of the experience? You know, that brings to mind because in the United States, we don't have kings and we don't have, you know, you know, hierarchy like they do in Europe. They have kings and lords and earls. And, um, <clears throat> so our perspective of this is very different. When you go to Europe, and you visit the cathedrals, and you visit the castles, you do not go in shorts and halter tops. You will wear nice clothes. That's just the way it is. And in a lot of the cathedrals, they have baskets of wraparound clothes. So even for men, if you show up in shorts, you're going to wear a skirt when you go into the cathedral. And, um, you know, just because they have this idea of decorum for, for presentation, and I, I think about that here because since we don't have that same um, vision of kings here, how many times do we go to church and people are wearing torn clothes, ratty clothes, and we get to the point where, you know, people say, have said to me, oh, but, you know, some people can't afford clothes. But, you know, I've grown up all over the world, and one of one of the places I lived in when I was very small was Honduras, one of the poorest countries in this world. Even going to church, those people got cleaned up. They wore they wore the best that they had. It wasn't they didn't wear their 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 go to school clothes. They didn't wear their go to work clothes. They wore something that was special, and it may be the same outfit they would wear every Sunday, but that was the best that they had. But they clean themselves up. And, and we see people go to church now, they'll walk in off the farm without washing their hands. Or they they come from someplace and, you know, they couldn't even bother to run a comb through their hair. It's a form of, of rebellion, I think. It, I've often thought that uh, it, it's a way of saying the authorities and the church are not really going to tell me what to do. But we, um, that is kind of also a, <clears throat> uh, another addition to, to Sharon's point. We were recently visited by a priest from Nigeria. And when we took him out to dinner, he, he commented to the effect that in, in Nigeria, his parishioners dress better than we do here in the United States. And, and so that was kind of an interesting comment. I, I think the most important part in terms of the dress is is to consider where we are at. And, of course, some people, you know, it's not to say that we need to show up to mass in in tuxedos and and ball gowns, um, but we should consider where we are going and what we are doing and that we are going to be in the presence of the king. And so, therefore, we should at least consider uh, our modesty in, in terms of how we show up for the mass. Now, sometimes it could be a matter of circumstance that, um, that you know, um, we may be in a position that we don't have time to go home and, and, and change or, or for whatever uh, reason, um, but we still should, should consider as we, as we arrive, are we arriving at least in a, um, uh, in a motive of modesty and, and uh, you know, respect for others as, as well. So it's, 
Um, it is a judgment in terms of, of how people do come and arrive at the Mass. But like Sharon said, this is when they show up in, in terms of clothes that you would, you would wear to the beach or that you would wear to, wear to a rock concert, is that really giving respect for the king, so to speak? We went to Mass in Las Vegas one time, and, and there was a, uh, a priest, who, this was summertime, it was hot, and everybody was wearing clothes that were comfortable. And boy, he got up and gave, you know, the hellfire and brimstone talk about, you know, if you're going to receive Jesus in your hand, by golly, wash those hands before you come to church. <laughs> and don't chew gum. And, you know, I mean, he really gave them a, a love for it. It was, it, was, it was the first time I think I'd ever heard a priest get up and talk like that. But it makes sense. It's fascinating to me that you mentioned Nigerians and uh, you mentioned Central Americans, I guess. Neither culture is rich mm -hmm. and yet they do have the wherewithal to dress up to go to church and i'll tell you if you want to see somebody dress up go to a mexican celebration around here mm -hmm. yeah. boy oh boy you know whether it's a quinceanera or a wedding or whatever it is they may not necessarily uh, be fancied up for mass as much but uh, they dress well yeah mm -hmm. and yeah and they're not necessarily rich. Yeah. yeah. And, and it does go back to what, what Jeff mentioned, that do we view Mass as being an audience with the king? And just think, if, if you did go visit the Pope, you would be, be trying to immortalize that in some fashion. This would be a great memory to be able to tell the grandkids and like that. And maybe it's because, ideally, we're going to Mass at least once a week, um, blessed are those who get to go to Mass every day. Uh, and so that may be the tendency that, well, do we take it for granted? And, of course, I'm not saying that we should immortalize our attendance at Mass by taking selfies and group pictures. Hey, you know, I was here and, and, and all those types of things. But we do have an opportunity to immortalize the Mass in terms of how we allow the Mass to influence us, how we allow the Mass to make us wiser, to make us stronger, to allow us to make better choices for our day, so that as we go our separate ways, if you will, uh, we're better able to, to deal with, with the world, and sometimes a very evil world that's, that's around us. You know, one of the thought about clothing, whenever, we moved around a lot when I was a kid, but whenever we had the chance, my folks were quick to put us in Catholic schools. And I guess was that a statement on that we weren't very good kids and we needed the discipline? I'm not sure. But I remember a nun telling us one time, we wore uniforms to school, but every once in a while you had a day where you got to dress up and wear whatever you wanted other than your uniform. And she used, and I remember her saying, you behave the way you are dressed. And I think that's true. It is, and, and you influence others in the way you are dressed. I'm, I'm thinking now of uh, one of our parishioners who is always dressed in a tie, and just being around him emphasizes the dignity of the, of the whole celebration. Mm -hmm. You know, during the discussion portion of the course that we were taking um, <clears throat> from Jeff, we were asked, how might this perspective change the way we participate in the Mass? And, I, and it's that perspective of understanding that it, you know, we're, we, we are participating in an event where, where we have the real presence of Christ. So therefore, it's the real presence of the King of Kings. So I think it's something that we should consider as we look to enable our children in understanding and consider how we can help them experience all the blessings of the, that the Mass has to offer. So today we're going to discuss the introductory rites, the portion of the Mass um, where we prepare ourselves to listen to the Word of God and to celebrate the Eucharist. And in the general <clears throat> instruction of the Roman Missal, um, article number 46, the for the introductory rites it states, their purpose is to ensure that the faithful who come together as one establish communion 
and dispose themselves properly listening to the word of God and to celebrate the Eucharist worthily. Now, it begins, of course, with the entrance procession. And when we look at the question, why we gather, we can look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, which says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And there we see clearly laid out that as we gather for the Mass, obviously or hopefully there's more than two of us there, um, and, but we see here that if where two or three are gathered, there, they, there Christ is within our midst. And so therefore, truly, we do have an audience with the King. Another thing that we, we traditionally do as the uh, part of the entrance procession is to sing a hymn. And if we look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, it states, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach, and admonish one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. So we usually uh, accompany the entrance with a hymn, and of course we use hymns during the course of the Mass. And of course there are some people like me who struggle in our singing. So the, the question is, is this section only for those with gifted voices, or should we all seek to join in the hymns? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, first of all, I've heard you sing. <laughs> And it doesn't, it doesn't sound like you're struggling to me. I think it sounds great. It's but just when I can catch a note. <laughs> in a, in a, the truth is we all struggle in our singing, no matter how much we've been uh, blessed enough to be able to accomplish with it. You always wish you were doing better. Um, but the general answer to that is all should join if they can. Now, some people say, I don't sing. Fine. But it is intended for everyone to participate. In fact, as choir people, Helen and I are deathly afraid that we'll be the only ones singing up there. (laughs) We want some backup. (laughs) It it is true that as an individual to sing a cappella is a very difficult thing to do. But when we are singing as a group, the one thing that we should note is that um, the voices blend. The voices blend, and and so therefore we do we are able to lift up uh, ourselves in in psalms and hymns and, and prayer. So um, unless we we don't have a voice at all, then we should try to offer it up. And of course, as I've heard, heard one person say, is this as well? God's given me many gifts, and singing was not one of them, so I'll let him know. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when we sing, and, and we're, we're singing to God, we have to always remember that he gave us the voice. So if it wasn't good, that's his fault, but he can, he can endure. But the other thing, <laughs> a, lot of people can, a lot of people can understand this one better, though. The thing is to pray twice. And I heard this as a kid when I was growing up and we were singing in choirs. Pray twice. I think if people understood that, it might give them a little more of a jump start to get in there. And, and I do believe it's up to the leaders of the singing to have music that is beautiful, but when, the, when it's time for the congregation to sing, it, it should be within, a, not not simplistic, not not. Um, it's got to be singable, it's, but it should be at least singable. At other times, if if you're in a very formal situation, then the greatest of music should be performed. Mm-hmm. And I also think some uh, Gregorian chant needs to be used more because it is beautiful when it is sung properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, people will not like Gregorian mm-hmm. chant when it is sung improperly. Absolutely. So <clears throat> as the procession comes to, to the altar, the priest and um, those within the procession give reverence to the altar. The priest then makes the sign of the cross and begins the greeting to the people. 
And he says, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is um, a reflection of Matthew chapter 28, 19, which says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The people respond with an amen. And this is also a reflection of 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 36, which says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, Amen, Hallelujah. The priest then greets the people with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And this is a reflection of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, which says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. When the priest gives us this greeting, to what is the priest calling our attention to? The Holy Trinity. That's mm-hmm. what I get from it. So we can, we can go back to, to Matthew 18:20. And we recognize that Christ is there within our presence. But we also see that, that the Holy Spirit is there with us as well, that we're able to receive the Holy Spirit. And, of course, we respond with, and with your spirit. And there's, there's three citations of Scripture that we can refer to here that, sh- that shows this response uh, of spirit. One is in Galatians chapter 6, 18. It says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. And then also in Philippians chapter 4, verse 23, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And we see a similar greeting in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 22, where it reads, The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with all of you. And so we then greet the priest in a similar fashion um, uh, as far as He bringing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us. And we are reflecting that back for the blessing of our priests. So with the entrance procession, the reverence of the altar, and the greeting of the people, what does this gathering symbolize? Well, you know, when you go to visit somebody in their home and you walk in and greet each other, Sometimes with hugs, sometimes with shaking hands, sometimes, oh, hi, how are you? You know, to me, that's what this is all about. We're there, we're, 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 we're welcoming Christ, we're welcoming the Father and the Holy Spirit into our gathering space. We're welcoming the, welcoming the priest and the persona Christi to be there with us. <clears throat> we're, we're, we're getting this started. We're ready to, to start this, this gathering um, and this this time together. And just like when we go to someone's house, you know, we sit down, we, we go in, and we, we get to know each other, we, we greet each other, and then maybe we'll get drinks or we'll have a meal or something. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're getting ready to get a teaching and, and, and be fed. And so this is the beginning. This is, this is just all pulling together. It also establishes the purpose of this gathering. Uh, we're here to talk about and commune with um, the three persons of God. Mm-hmm. And who are we coming together as? The yeah. church. And we're, we're coming together as the church, and we're also coming together as the body of Christ. Remember, Christ is, is the head of the church and also the head of the body. And so this is, this is a gathering. And although we may do this in, <clears throat> in parishes, large and small, it's also happening around the world. <clears throat> and it's kind of awesome to think, as we, we mentioned in, uh, in the beginning, in terms of what the catechism says, it's a foretaste of the heavenly liturgy. And therefore, we are joining together also with that heavenly liturgy. So we're coming together as a group, as the, as the body of Christ. And we, the priest then starts us off with the penitential act. And, and of course, this, this may not be said at every Mass, because depending upon the situations for the Mass, the, the priest has, has three different options for the penitential act. But the confederator is, um, is one, 
And the way this reads is, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. And this is a reflection of James chapter 3, verse chapter 5, verse 16. Sorry, my eyes aren't working properly. Um, therefore, and it reads, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The fervent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. We continue, in my thoughts and in my words, which is a reflection of James chapter 3, verse 6, which states, the tongue is also a fire. It exists among our members as a world of malice, defiling the whole body and setting the entire course of our lives on fire, itself set on fire by Gehenna. We continue in saying, in what I have done. And that's a reflection of Romans 12, 16, which says, have the same regard for one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. But we're also reminded in James chapter 2, verse 18, that says, Indeed, someone may say, You have faith, and I have works. Demonstrate your faith to me without works, and I will demonstrate my faith to you from my works. And so we, so we are looking at what we have done, and then we also need to look at we continue and says, And in what I have failed to do, and we can look at Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 to 45, where it says, where Jesus tells us, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or ill or in prison and not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of the, these least ones, you did not do for me. So it does matter as to what we have done and what we failed to do. We continue and say, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And what are we asking for here when we ask for these prayers? What type of prayer is that? Well, I, I guess I would say it's a petition. Uh, you are... Uh, Requesting mm -hmm. help to lead to your own salvation through reconciliation of your sins. We're asking for intercessory prayers. We're asking others to pray for us. Right. And look at who we're asking. Mary, the Holy Mother of God, all the angels, all the saints, as well as you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me, for the Lord our God. And we see many examples in Scripture of intercessory prayer. Uh, for example, um, then the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned in complaining against the Lord and you. Pray to the Lord to take the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And this was in Numbers chapter 21, verse 7. And then also in Judith 8.31, we see a, another example of a request for intercessory prayer. And it reads, but now since you are a devout woman, Pray for us that the Lord may send rain to fill up our cisterns. Then we will no longer be fainting from thirst. And then we see another example in Baruch um, chapter 1, verse 13, where it reads, Pray for us to the Lord our God, for we have sinned against the Lord our God. Even to this day, the wrath of the Lord and his anger have not turned away from us. Another example is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 25, where Brothers, pray for us, too. And then finally, we see an example in 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. This says, finally, brothers, pray for us, so that the word of the Lord may speed forward and be glorified as it did among you. So now we've said this act of penance. What are we accomplishing by, by making this statement in the Mass? One of the things 
about this particular penitential act. It is not well received by our society as a whole, and even in church, because we are being taught that we nothing really is our fault and we should not put ourselves down. You know, uh, and to say through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, it it, it sound you know it is. Don't say that. Don't say that about yourself. Don't because it is not your fault. It is everything around you. But in not being allowed to say that, we can't really reach out and ask for forgiveness mm-hmm. by recognizing that. Our lives are in our control. Uh, if we don't, if we do not accept responsibility for our own sins, we lose control of our own lives. We are our lives are then put into the control of those around us. Mm-hmm. And if we recognize those faults and ask for forgiveness, then we're able to move forward. But if it's not our fault, we have no power. Yeah. And, and that's one thing that we have to reflect upon is, is that our choices are our responsibility. Now, sometimes we may be tricked into something, um, but in reality, when we're seduced, there's still, there's still our ability to reason as to, uh, and, and, and therefore mostly of what we do or what we fail to do is often the consequences of conscious choice, our own. Right, and we can look back over our sins and see the steps around us that led us to that, but when it gets right down to it, we are responsible. To me, there's two, uh, two things that this accomplishes. One is it uh, reminds us of our inherent weakness as human beings, and it uh, cures or attempts to overcome uh, arrogance, which we may have brought into church with us. We may be thinking about that new car that we uh, drove up in, Mm -hmm. and it uh, gets our minds focused on uh, what we're really here for, which is to seek salvation. It's also an introduction to the idea of confession Mm -hmm. and reconciliation, which is probably the most important sacrament our faith has. And, of course, that's a, that's a good point to bring up because as we make this statement in the Mass, the priest then gives us absolution, but what he's giving us absolution for is venial sins. And these are sins of things that we have done wrong, but they don't fully separate us from God. They can be repaired, if you will. But when we, ha- when we experience mortal sin, we need to go to confession. And usually mortal sin is of such a serious nature, we don't like to confess it in in public, and so we profess it to the priest and the persona of Christ. And there in that confessional, he gives us absolution. But this is still a similar thing. It's still uh, an act of penance. And, of course, the priest, uh, and and this reminds us of of, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it tells us that if we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. And so the priest, um, after we say that, that penitential act, he responds that by saying, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. And we respond again with an amen, which is an affirmation as we mentioned in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 36. Isn't it interesting that the priest says this right along with us and prays to Almighty God to have mercy on us, not y'all. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that, it makes, that, that makes very good sense because the priest is human too. Absolutely. Yeah. But this is, this is forgiving our, our venial sins, mm-hmm. like I just said a little bit ago. And so those things that are easy to, you know, well, venial sins go. Remember what Jesus says about the cold water and the hot water and the lukewarm. He mm-hmm. spews out the lukewarm. And that's where the venial sins come in, where we're not really bad. 
that it starts opening the door. Yeah. Right and now, then really as we start, start closing to the line, yeah. then it opens the door for us to go over the line. You know, if we could back up for just a second. Sure. In my thoughts and in my words, mm -hmm. and uh, this verse that you uh, referred to here, the tongue is also a fire. It exists among our members as a world of malice. That's one of the great ills of our society right now is careless, hateful talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's everywhere. And it's, um, and, it, and it's become an outgrowth of our political parties that, that somehow they have fallen into this trap to believe that the only way they can preserve political power is by demonizing anybody that doesn't agree with them. And so people start taking this as an example. This is what our political leaders are doing. I mean, just listen to their news conferences um, and, and the way they snipe at one another, uh, trying to score points uh, against one another. And so the tendency then is for us to take that into our personal lives. I mean, just, and then you can see how it gets played out uh, on things like social media where people feel like they're really anonymous. But when people are face-to-face, -face, we seem to be just a little bit more cordial to one another. <laughs> but even then, we're starting to see example after example where that cordiality is going away. That protest now is not a means of raising an issue so people will have visibility of it. it, is, it the means of protest is, is not only starting off with verbal slurs, but it starts going into violent acts against one another strangers, people we don't even know, and, and we, we use the excuses of racist, racism and bigotry and all these types of things, but all it is is a means to shut down conversation. And, it, and for whatever reason, this trap has been formed for us politically that says that um, we cannot approach one another with civility if we're going to maintain our political power. How sad is that? How, you know, it's a, it's a very sad commentary on our society. But then it also means, you know, if, if we go back to the history of the Bible, we see all these examples in there how people have fallen away from the guidance of God, but it's always a remnant few that then brings the people back. So we do have that opportunity. We do have the opportunity to make that choice that says, while others may respond to us incordially, we have the opportunity for compassion and civility and to accept the, the example for that. And right. certainly that's the example we want to be able to, to set at mass. Yeah, we uh, need to understand that hate, you, you've mentioned this before in other discussion, the devil is not concerned about who or what we hate, just as long as we hate. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, then we have the Curie. And Kyrie eleison translated is Lord have mercy. And we have several examples in scripture of where uh, there are those who, who ask for the mercy of the Lord. One of the first examples we see is in Tobit uh, chapter 8 verse 4. And it says, when Sarah's parents left the bedroom and closed the door behind them, Tobiah rose from bed and said to his wife, my sister, come, let us pray and beg our Lord to grant us mercy and protection. Now, now, we have to understand the fullness of this story. Uh, Tobiah and Sarah had just been married. This is their wedding night. And not, not many of us would, would think of, well, as part of the, the first step of our wedding night, we should, we should hop out of bed and, and pray. But if you look at Tobiah's situation, he might actually have an incentive there because Sarah had seven other husbands before Tobiah, and those seven husbands all perished on their wedding night. So may, maybe there's a reason for this. <laughs> but anyway, we go to, to Judith, uh, chapter 6, verse 19, where it says, Lord God of heaven, look at their arrogance. Have mercy on our people in their abject state, and look with favor this day on the faces of those who are consecrated to you. And, of course, the people are rising up asking for this mercy as they are facing an enemy that is, getting ready to destroy them. We, we start the Kyrie with Lord have mercy, and then we say Christ have mercy. And this is a reflection of 1 Timothy chapter 1, 2, which, says, which Paul writes to Timothy, my true child in faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, 
the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. We then respond again with, Lord, have mercy. And there's two other scriptural examples of the, of the request for mercy. And in Psalms chapter 30, 11, it states, Hear, O Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. And also in Baruch chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Hear, Lord, and have mercy, for you are a merciful God. Have mercy on us who have sinned against you. So as we reflect upon the Kyrie, I'd like you to also consider the following scripture from uh, a Psalm of David. And it says, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, have mercy on me, God, in accord with your merciful love. In your abundant compassion, blot out my transgressions. Thoroughly wash away my guilt, and from my sin cleanse me. For I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your eyes, so that you are just in your word and without reproach in your judgment. Behold, I was born in guilt. In sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, your desire, behold, you desire true sincerity, and secretly you teach me wisdom. Cleanse me with hyssop, that I may be pure. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. You will let me hear gladness and joy. The bones you have crushed will rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. A clean heart create for me, God. Renew within me a steadfast spirit. Do not drive me from before your face, nor take from me your Holy Spirit. Restore to me the gladness of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. I will teach the wicked your ways, that sinners may return to you. Rescue me from violent bloodshed, God, my saving God, and my tongue will sing joyfully to your justice. Lord, you will open my lips, and my mouth will proclaim your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or I would give it. A burnt offering you would not accept. My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit, a contrite, humbled heart. O God, you will not scorn. Treat Zion kindly according to your good will. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. So again, David here is also offering a form of intercessory prayer as he asks for the goodwill uh, of God for Zion and the walls of Jerusalem. And it concludes, Then you will desire the sacrifices of the just, burnt offering and whole offerings. Then they will offer up young bulls on your altar. Another, another uh, element of scripture I'd like you to consider as well is uh, and behold, a Canaanite woman of that district came and called out, have pity on me. In the Dewey Rhymes version, it uses the word have mercy on me. Lord, son of David, she's talking to Christ. She says, my daughter is tormented by a demon, but he did not say a word in answer to her. His disciples came and asked him, send her away, for she keeps calling out for us. He said in reply, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman came and did him homage, saying, Lord, help me. Jesus said in reply, It is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Please, Lord, for even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. And Jesus said to her in reply, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that hour. So as we say or sing the Kyrie, for what reason and for whom do we ask mercy? If we are going to seek salvation, we must acknowledge the existence of mercy and the need for it, because if that weren't a requirement, we could save ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, as to for whom do we ask mercy? Um, basically, it's personal to me. Um, maybe we're asking it for all of us, but I think to most people it's going to come down to me, mm -hmm. my sins. I want mercy. We're asking mercy for ourselves as part of that <clears throat> that penance, that recognition, if you will, that that we are sinful people, that we we do need the Lord's mercy for our salvation. But as we also see in the scripture here, we have the opportunity to ask for mercy for 
for those who are in need. And, and as we prepare for the Mass, that may be something that we want to think about in our hearts, is, is who do we offer prayers for? Uh, so we have the opportunity when we say, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, to have within our hearts prayers also uh, that, are, that are lifting up where we're asking that mercy to be directed. And, and Dan, as you said, part of that is we may be asking mercy for ourselves, but we also have the opportunity at this point to, to ask mercy for others who are in need. It may be a loved one. It may be a stranger. This story here uh, of the Canaanite woman, I think it's, it's kind of always bothered me because you wonder, well, it's so unlike our idea of who Jesus was to treat this woman, you know. But actually, it just, just now occurred to me, that is how we are to approach Christ. She begged him. Mm-hmm. And she's our example of how we are to approach Christ. Perseverance and faith. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and need. She knew she needed him. And although it seemed like he wasn't listening to her, he was, her. or that he was, mm-hmm. he was listening to her. He was. And he, she was there, and the disciples wanted her to go away. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, I think maybe Jesus was instructing his disciples through this action also. Yeah. And, and at first, you might, might even be to look at this as maybe his first response was a test of her faith. She persevered in her faith, and finally he said, how great is your faith, so there, let it be done for you. No, he was yeah. good. Yeah. Yes. Well, that, that is a fascinating story to me also. Let's continue into the Gloria, and and here we can go line by line, and you know when we when we say these things, it's we we again find their roots within the Scripture, because we say glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill, and of course this is the song of the angels as they announce uh, announce the birth of our Lord and Savior as they sing glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. This is the song of the angels to the shepherds. We continue in the glory and we say, we praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. And this is a reflection of Revelation chapter 7, verse 12, which says, Amen, blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then we continue, Lord God, heavenly King, O God, almighty Father. And this is a reflection of Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. It says, Then I heard something like the sound of a great multitude, or the sound of rushing water, or mighty peals of thunder, as they said, Alleluia, the Lord has established his reign, our God, the Almighty. We continue in the Gloria by saying, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, which is a reflection of 2 John chapter 3, which says, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us, from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. We continue by saying, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Which is a reflection of John chapter 1, verse 29, that says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And that was John the Baptist who was, who was speaking. We continue in the glory by saying, you take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us, which is a reflection of Romans chapter 8, verse 34, which states, who will condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, rather, was raised, who also is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. And, of course, the reason for his intercession is his love for us and his mercy for us. We continue by saying, for you alone are the Holy One, which is a reflection of Luke chapter 4, uh, verse 34. It says, it, and this was a response by, by demons that Jesus was driving out. And they, and they said to him, ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So even the demons recognize Jesus as the Holy One. We continue by saying, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, which is also reflected in Luke chapter 1, verse 32. He will be great, and we and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. And we conclude the Gloria by saying, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father, amen, which is a reflection of John chapter 14, verse 26. It says, where Jesus told his uh, disciples that he will not send them away as, uh, he will not leave them as orphans as, as he uh, goes to be with the Father. But he said, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. So the question is, is as we say the Gloria, what are we doing? Thank you. We're praising, we're focusing our minds toward uh, the ultimate power of God who is going to control our destiny. Yeah. So we're lifting our, lifting our hearts up in thanks and praise. Um, and, and even in there when we say we're acknowledging that he's the one that takes away the sins of the world, and we're again asking for his, his mercy. Now something that we should note here is the glory is, is not said uh, during two seasons, which are Advent and Lent. And in the case of Advent, um, it's so that we may experience a renewed joy as we sing the song of the angels at Christmas. So it's we're away from it for a while, and then all of a sudden at Christmas, we are able to, to experience that joy again and join in the song of the angels, which is glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. But then in the case of, of uh, Lent, the reason why we don't say it there, it's because our reflection turns to the sorrow of our sins during that time period and our need to reconcile with our most merciful Lord. So after the Gloria, we move into the Collect. And in um, Article 54 of the General Instruction of the Roman Mystery, it says that the priest calls upon the people to pray, and everybody together with the priest observes a brief silence so they may become aware of being in God's presence and may call to mind their intentions. Then the priest pronounces the prayer, <clears throat> usually called the collect, and through which the character of the celebration finds expression. By an ancient tradition of the church, the collect prayer is usually addressed to God the Father through Christ in the Holy Spirit. So the priest leads the prayers of the collect, which are different for every Mass. But note that the, the general instruction of the Roman Missal states that the priest calls upon the people to pray. And, and in this moment where we are praying together, is there a particular scripture of which we're reminded of? Is there a particular scripture that, that helps us see that that our prayers are heard and answered. Well, if I may cheat by reading <laughs> what you wrote. <laughs> Matthew, um, again, oh, no, I... No, I gave the answers to the quiz. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. And uh, that's probably what we're trying to accomplish this is the first time I've ever heard the term the collect, the good catechesis for me. Mm -hmm. and, and if we could maybe look at it, it's, it's we're collecting the prayers to, to lift them up. And of course, uh, in continuing that scripture, uh, in verse 20, uh, it says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And so this is a, a, another reinforcement when we look at, at Matthew chapter 18 verses 19 to 20 that we are in the audience of the king. It's also as I mentioned uh, earlier that that our prayers are being lifted up as as we see in Re uh, Revelation chapter 5 verse 8 where it says uh, again when he referring to the lamb who seemed to have been slain of course that's referring to Jesus took the scroll the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, 
Each of the elders held a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the holy ones. Our prayers are being collected and lifted up to heaven. So some quotes I'd like, like to share with you here before we conclude. And the first one is, is from St. Gemma, I can't, St. Gemma, I can't pronounce your last name, Galgani, Gal, something like that. <laughs> and, and, she, uh, and the quote is, oh, Jesus, if I but considered attentively your immense solicitude for me, how greatly should I excel in every virtue? Pardon me, oh, Jesus, so much carelessness. Pardon such great ignorance. My God, Jesus, my love, in created goodness, what would have become of me if you had not drawn me to yourself? Open your heart to me. Open to me your sacramental breast. I open mine to you. And so as we attend a Mass, that's one of the questions that we should have for ourselves is, are we opening our hearts to receive the full blessings of the Mass? St. Augustine said, the angels surround and help the priest when he is celebrating Mass. Yeah. That, that, and, and, and it's a new concept for me, too, within the last oh, maybe a year, thinking in terms of when he raises the hopes, there's all these angels there that I cannot see. Mm-hmm. And then St. Basil said, we should not accept in silence the benefactions of God, but return thanks for them. And St. Edith Stein said, Every true prayer is a prayer of the church. By means of that prayer, the church prays, since it is the Holy Spirit living in the church, who in every single soul prays in us with unspeakable groanings. And that's something that we consider, too, is is that, of course, when we go to the Mass, we join in a number of prayers, but we also have the opportunity to offer our own prayers from our hearts. All of that will be collected and lifted up. So we can prepare for the Mass by thinking of the, the prayers that we want to say, even though we may not speak them out loud. But we know that as, as we gather together um, in this and that we are in Christ, Christ's presence, then as we continue to offer our prayers, it's one, a reflection of our faith, but we can also remember the Canaanite woman and it was her perseverance of faith that, and, 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 and like you mentioned, um, at, at first, Jesus kind of dismissed her, but he's not going to dismiss us if we come to him with the strength of faith. And then finally, St. Francis of Assisi, he said, what does the poor man do in the rich man's door, the sick man in the presence of his physician, the thirsty man at a limpid stream? What they do, I do before the Eucharist. I pray, I adore, I love. We have that opportunity at the Mass. We are showing up wounded in some form or fashion. We are not perfect beings. We are seeking his mercy for our failings and his healing so that we might be a better person when we leave. And so I, I have some final thoughts here. As we opened our discussion today, we noted that the purpose of the introductory rites are to ensure that the faithful who come together as one, establish communion, and depose of themselves properly to listen to the word of God and to celebrate the Eucharist worthily. And again, this comes out of Article 46 of the General Instruction of the Roman Missal. It is for this reason that we, that as we gather, we do so in a quiet manner. As we await for the priest to begin the procession, it is an opportunity to turn our thoughts away from the noise of the world so we may prepare ourselves to hear the gentle voice of the Lord. And again, I'd like you to consider the following scripture. And this comes from <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 19. Um, verses 11 to 13, which reads, Then the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord will pass by. There was a strong and violent wind rendering the mountains and crushing rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. 
After the fire, a light, silent sound, a whistle. And in the Dewey Rhymes version, that phrase is replaced with a whistling of gentle air. So when we consider this, when, when he heard this, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. A voice said to him, why are you here, Elijah? And so as we attend the Mass, I think that's something that we should keep in mind, is that God speaks us to us with a quiet voice. And so we need to prepare our hearts so that we do take away the, the sounds of the world or the noise of the world. So again, we've come to an end of another hour. Let's conclude with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open and discuss your holy word. We pray that as we go our separate ways, you will continue to walk with us and help us to see how we may put on the armor of truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of the gospel, not only for the benefit of our lives, but also the lives of all who cross our path. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless. And we hope you can join us again next week as we go, as we continue the scriptural walk through the Mass with the Liturgy of the Word. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.